Today's scripture reading is from Romans 8, 18 through 27. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and glory of, children, of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has, begun, has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have, but, but if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. God bless the reading of his word. Thank you, James. I appreciate James reading today's scripture for us as we continue through this study of this mountaintop of the entire Bible, one of them anyway, Romans chapter 8. We began a couple of weeks ago in verses 1 through 4, and then last week we continued in verses 5 through 17, and now today we're looking at verses 18 through 27. In verses 1 through 4, we see what God has done for us in the past. In verses 5 through 17, we see what God is doing for us in the present. And now in verses 18 through 27, we see what God will do for us in the future. Theologians refer to what God has done for us in the past as justification, and what God is doing for us in the present as sanctification. And theologians use the word glorification to speak about what God is going to do for us in the future. Our series is called Engaged because in Romans chapter 8, we see an invitation from Paul to get engaged with the God who is deeply, passionately engaged with us. The Harvard Business Review published a piece by uh, Bill Taylor a few years ago, and it was called Why You Should Reminisce About the Future. Now, usually we hear the word reminisce and we think of the past. But Taylor was saying in this article that men and women who run companies should have such a crystal clear picture of what they want their business to accomplish. As they think about that future, it's as if they are reminiscing about a fond memory. Now in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul says the same thing. He says that you and I as believers should have a cl such a clear picture of the future God has in store for us that as we think about it, is this, it's as if we are reminiscing about a fond memory. Now, reminiscing can make us cry as well as smile. When you think about the past, uh, you think about the way things were, you think about the people you used to know, and it makes you smile, but it makes you perhaps sigh or moan at the same time because you're not having those experiences anymore. You're not with those people anymore. In the same way as we reminisce about the future, it will also make us sigh or moan because we want what's to come to hurry up and come. Now what's interesting in, in these verses is who is doing the groaning? We certainly think of ourselves doing the groaning and the sighing, but what's interesting is creation itself and the Spirit himself also groans or sighs as we reminisce about the future. So I want you to find a pen or a pencil in your sermon notes. Let's write these things down because I think it may surprise you what and who is doing the groaning. First of all, according to the Apostle Paul, creation groans. Romans chapter 8 verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. 
He speaks of creation all throughout this, this, this section of verses. He speaks of creation as if he was speaking about a, a person. So in verse 19, he says, the physical world waits and waits eagerly for something. He says in verse 20 that the physical world gets frustrated. He says in verse 22 that it groans. Now these are terms that you apply to persons, right? You don't, you don't use these terms to refer to mountain ranges or trees or, or pancreas cells. But the Apostle Paul is using these words in a poetic, personified way to help us understand something about creation. He uses figurative language to help us understand why we experience de decay and deterioration and ultimately death in this physical world. It's almost as if the physical world is trying to say to us, you are not experiencing me the way I was meant to be experienced when God created me. Verse 20 uses a judicial word. What that means is uh, it's a word about a king's decree or a judge's verdict. God subjected the created order to the condition that we currently experience the created order in. And so nature itself is hoping for a different future than, than the way we experience nature today. In, in verses 19 through 21, the physical world is compared to a man at a race. Uh, when you are standing on the sidelines and you wanna know the end result of a race, you lean out you crane your neck, you look down the road in anticipation to see that, that person or that group of persons who are racing toward you. And the Apostle Paul says that that is the picture that we ought to have when we think of mountain ranges and trees and the cells of our body and so on. Creation itself is standing at the edge, craning, craning its neck, looking toward someone who is to arrive. And who is that someone? Nature is anticipating the arrival of you and me. Not the way you and I are right now, but the way you and I will be at the resurrection of the body. You, you see, in Genesis chapter 3, because of the moral fall of mankind, creation itself was subjected to decay, according to this passage of Scripture. So, so because we experience a moral fall, creation itself experienced a fall. And the promise of the Bible is then that when we are resurrected from that fallenness, when we're given our uh, new heavenly body, that is a signal that creation itself will be set right. It will be fixed. It will be set into the way that it was always intended to be experienced. And so Paul speaks of creation as if it were a person waiting in anticipation for you and me and our resurrection glory to finally arrive so creation can be the way it needs to be as well. Now, I wonder if that's the way you think about our world and the future of our world. For a lot of people, they think this is the Christian story. We face difficulty, we face setback, we face pain, we face heartache here. But when we die, we'll escape this old world and get into heaven and not have to deal with this anymore. And if people think that that's what the story of Christianity is all about, then they, they don't quite know what to do with all these promises of the resurrection of the body and the restoration of creation. I mean, isn't the point to escape all the pain and brokenness and heartache, heart, heartache of this world and not deal with it anymore? But this is... If, if this was the, the actual story, then what we would be leaving behind would be territory of God's creation that was still under the banner of Satan and under the ruin of Satan. God's victory over sin isn't going to be finished until God gains victory over everything that sin messed up. And that includes this creation, this world, and our experience, our bodily experience in it. I've used this analogy with several of you before, but it's such a useful analogy that you're going to have to hear it again. There was a movie sometime back called Red Dawn. Now, I'm not referring to the cheesy remake of a few years ago. I'm referring to the cheesy original. <laughs> and you remember in that story that uh, communists invaded the United States, and there was, there was this scrappy band of high school students that formed a, this resistance movement, and eventually they were able to win back America from the communists, ultimately. Now, let's imagine that really happened, and, 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 a, and an enemy invasion came and took over our country. And through this resistance force, we were able to win back most of American land, 
all except New England. Now, with all our regional rivalries in the United States, uh, we would still be disappointed if we had won back most of the United States, but New England was still under the banner of our enemy. We would still be waging the resistance and fighting until all that had been American land was, was American land once again. When Jesus came to, to die for us, our, our souls were reclaimed from the enemy. But God isn't going to be finished fixing sin until he fixes everything that sin messed up. So long as these bodies are subject to decay and put into a ground that's subject to decay, then there is still consequence of sin around. And, and so that's why we have in Romans chapter 8 and everywhere else in the, in, in the Bible that the full story isn't that we just simply escape this world. The full story is that God's going to fix this world and fix our uh, resurrection experience in this world and in this new heaven and this new earth. That's the promise. And that's why we see the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 saying that creation is groaning in anticipation for that to finally come so that the creation itself is no longer under, is no longer subjected to decay, but is experiencing the glory that is ours as well. Until that time comes, creation groans. Write the second point down. We groan. We groan. Romans chapter 8 verse 20, uh, 23 says, We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we await the adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. So verses 18 through 22 say creation sighs. Verses 23 through 25 say we sigh. Now in verse 23, Paul uses an interesting way to describe us. He says that we have the first fruits of the Spirit. In order to understand that phrase, you need to know what first fruits means and what Paul is referring to when he says the Spirit. So let's look at the, the, the Spirit. The Spirit is not an electric current. The Spirit is not the force. The Spirit is a he, not an it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, we read this phrase, Now the Lord is the Spirit. So what that is telling us is the Holy Spirit is how we experience God in the present tense. The Holy Spirit is, the Holy Spirit is not an errand boy of God. He is not an emissary of God. He is not a lesser being under God the Father. God is experienced by us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's who the Holy Spirit is then. But specifically, Paul does not just say we have the Spirit, but we have the first fruits of the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, the Bible was written in an agricultural setting. Even if not everybody who read the Bible originally were farmers, they still understood the rhythms of the seasons and so on. And the first fruits was a reference to those first heads of grain that would show up on the stalks out in the field. That was an indication that there was more to come and a harvest was on its way. Now, Paul uses the imagery of first fruits in a variety of ways in his writings. In this instance, he speaks of the first fruits of the Spirit to let us know that what we now experience with God through our experience with the Holy Spirit is just the down payment. It's just the engagement ring before the full wedding ceremony. It is the appetizer before the main course. And verse 23, Paul says that we who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly. Now it's interesting, he does not say, in spite of the fact that we experience the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan. He says precisely because we have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan. What, is, what does that mean? That means that we're already beginning to experience what communion with God is in its fullness going to be like at the end of time. We're already beginning to experience the power that he wants to provide for us and the guidance that he wants to provide for us. And because we're already beginning to experience that, it makes us long for all of it in its fullness. So we who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly, impatiently waiting for what's to come to finally come. So we want to be done with the decay and the deterioration and the death that separates us from our loved ones. We want to be finished with all of that, and that makes us groan. Now, some of you might say, well, doesn't everybody experience that? I mean, nobody likes deterioration. Nobody likes decay. Nobody likes the separation of death. 
But here's the big, here's the big difference between non-believers and believers. Everybody sighs when they compare what is to what was. Christians sigh when we compare what is to what will be. So when we look at what is and compare it to what was, of course we sigh because we'd like to be as healthy as we used to be, or we'd like to be as vigorous as we used to be, or we'd like to have those people around that we no longer have around. We all sigh when we compare what is to what was, but Christians compare what is to what's coming, and we long for it and groan for it to finally arrive. I remember early in my ministry in this church, and I was sitting with a frail woman. She was only in her early 40s at that point, but she was in a nursing home because so many health problems had placed her there. And as we visited one afternoon, there was a lull in the conversation, and she sighed and she said, I can't wait for my resurrection body. Now, what was she doing? She was doing exactly what the Apostle Paul says we all do in Romans chapter 8. We sigh, longing for that which is to come, to hurry up and come. Now, right at the start of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus issued eight statements of blessedness to certain people. And the second beatitude, as we call them, he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, I'm, I'm sure you've met some people that think that if you're really living the victorious Christian life, you'll never sigh, you'll never groan. If that's the case, then what do we do with the second beatitude? Blessed are those who mourn. If that's the case, what do we do with what Paul says here in Romans chapter 8, that we groan and sigh in anticipation for what's to come? No, if we really believe the future God is preparing for us, you will groan whenever you go through experiences that remind you that we are not there yet. When we lift up groans and sighs in that context, those simply become praise choruses in a minor key. But we have to be careful, don't we? Because not all groaning and sighing is sanctified groaning. Just like there is righteous anger and all kinds of unrighteous anger, there is righteous groaning and all kinds of unrighteous groaning. Some of us have to admit that our groaning is really just self-pity. Our groaning is really just a cry for attention. Our groaning is just anger that we're not getting our way, or it's faithless bitterness. So, so how do we know when our groans are coming from a point of faithfulness, and how do we know if our groans are actually coming from or an expression of faithlessness? Well, Paul tells us here, in verse 23 and verse 25. Let's look at them. Romans chapter 8, verse 23 says, Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly. And then Romans 8, verse 25. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So I want you to circle two words in those two verses or, or two phrases. First of all, in verse 23, circle the word eagerly. He says, We groan while we wait eagerly. And then in verse 25, circle the word patiently. He says, if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So he says, we, we wait. And then he uses two adverbs to help us understand the nature of our waiting, the quality of our waiting. He says, we wait eagerly and we wait patiently. Now, when I think of those two words, I think of eagerly as a more positive word and patiently as a a more muted word. Eagerly has the idea of something that you're anticipating, that you can't wait for. You're already savoring the thought of, of enjoying it. Patiently has the idea of enduring something that you're going through now, putting up with it. And so the Apostle Paul lets us know if our groans are out of faithlessness or if our groans are an expression of faithfulness. He says, are you groaning eagerly and patiently? If you're groaning because you can't wait for what God has in store for you in the future, then that's a faithful kind of groaning. If you're groaning in pa with patience, just uh, trusting that God will give you the power to endure what you're going through now, then your groans are out of faithfulness instead of out of faithlessness. So when your hope is so clear that it makes you sigh for its, fulf for its fulfillment, and when you groan and you sigh as an expression 
of the fact that you want God's future for you to finally hurry up and come, that's faith-filled groaning. It's the right kind of groaning. So verses 18 through 22 tell us creation groans. And then verses 23 through 25 tell us we groan. Now this may be the most surprising of all. The spirit groans. This is what we find in verses 26 and 27. There's that word groan again. Look at verse 26. The spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Now, some Bible scholars believe that the groaning there is just a continuation of our groaning. And the Holy Spirit takes that and, and lifts that groaning up to God in prayer. And that would be remarkable enough. But other Bible teachers say that no, the wordless groans in verse 26 are the Spirit's groans along with us. Is it so surprising to think that the Spirit himself groans with our groaning as he accompanies us through this broken world? If we remember incidences from Jesus' life, this is not so surprising. In John chapter 11, Jesus stood at the graveside of his best friend, Lazarus, a man who lived in the suburbs of Bethany outside of Jerusalem. Verses 33 and 38 of John chapter 11 say, when he was at the graveside of his good friend Lazarus, who had recently died, it said he was deeply moved in spirit. The King James Version translates it this way, he groaned in his spirit. He grieved over the death of his friend. He grieved for the broken-hearted experience that, that Mary and Martha, the sisters of this dead man, were experiencing. He grieved for all that was so broken about this world. And some of you say, yeah, but, but he was going to fix it. I mean, we know the rest of the story. He stood by the graveside of his good friend Lazarus. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, who had been dead four days earlier, came forth and was alive once again. But can't you picture a Jesus who, before he fixes Lazarus and raises him from the dead, grieves over the fact that he has to raise Lazarus from the dead? And in the same way, in Romans chapter 8, can't you see a Holy Spirit who grieves even as he knows he's going to fix that over which he is grieving now this is what we see I think in Romans chapter 8 and, and I, I don't know about you but that comforts me profoundly I told you at the start of this message that the main theme of Romans chapter 8 could be summarized in one word engaged engaged with the God who's engaged with you God isn't just off in the distance like Zeus on Mount Olympus living his best life now while we're going through the experiences we face. God isn't some observer or auditor at an SAT just watching you take the test of life. God is deeply engaged in every aspect of your life, past, present, and future. Now, of course, the wordless groans of the Holy Spirit aren't just in sympathy with our groans. They have a certain direction upward. He groans in intercession for us. So this word shows up twice in this passage, verse 26, verse 27. Verse 26, the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Verse 27, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people. To intercede for someone means to speak on their behalf, to advocate for them. So here's this deep mystery about the God who made us that he is all at the same time Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is the Son who responded to the Father's call to come and redeem the world. He is the Father who listens to the Spirit's prayers for us and the Spirit, he is the Spirit who lifts up those prayers. He is the Father who says, I have a plan to fix all that's ruined. And he is the Spirit who whispers to the Father, Oh, may it come sooner than soon. Now, this is a deep mystery, but this is who we relate to. This is who God is. And I find that actually a great comfort, even as a great mystery. Do you know another word for intercession? The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. Do you know, do you know a synonym for that? Prayer. Prayer. Think of that. God the Father listens to the prayers 
of God the Son and God the Spirit who is praying for us. Now think about that. What do you think that the Holy Spirit is praying to God about as he sees your life, as he accompanies you through the trials of your life right now? He's praying for your marriage. He's praying for that temptation to fall back into addiction again, that you might have strength not to do it. He sees your discouragement. He prays for fresh hope. He sees your fear, and he prays for courage. He sees you weakening to a temptation, and he prays for strength. And when we fall, the Spirit says, Father, remember the sacrifice of the Son and forgive him or her. I'm comforted to know that the Spirit sighs with my sighs, and he speaks to the Father on behalf of those sighs. In light of that, let's go to the Lord in prayer, the Lord who prays for us. Would you bow your heads and hearts? Now this passage is a passage to comfort believers, but there's a word here for those of us in this room or listening online who are not yet believers, and I'll mention it in a moment. But with heads bowed in prayer and eyes closed, uh, before we pray to God as believers, maybe just take a moment and just meditate, just think about the fact that God is praying to God for you. That even as you talk to God about your life, God, the Holy Spirit, is talking to God the Father about your life right now. Just picture what He is praying about. Picture what He is asking for so that you might be strengthened, so that you might be comforted, so that you might be healed, that you might be set free from shame. What is God the Spirit praying to God the Father about right now regarding your life? Heavenly Father, we have a song, Lord, listen to your children praying. And we also, as children, want to listen to the Spirit's praying praying for strength for us guidance for us comfort for us freedom for us thank you for being helping us remember today in the study of your word that you are so intensely involved in our lives you just don't weep as we weep but you lift up that weeping to the throne so that we might have the intervention of your grace and your mercy and your strength as we wait patiently and eagerly for the future to hurry up and come. But as I said, with all of us still bowed in prayer and eyes closed, even though this is a message for believers, this is also a message for those of you who need to come to believe. The Apostle Paul is telling Christians to be fully engaged, passively engaged with a God who is deeply engaged with us. Don't you want to have a God like that to talk to? Don't you want to have a God like that to relate to? Don't you want to know that there's a God like that who wants to accompany you through all the experiences you face here on this earth and bring you ultimately into the joys of heaven? If that's the desire of your heart, you're in the right place. It may be that the whole purpose of you coming to this place or tuning in today on, on the live stream was just for this moment that you could get some guidance on how to talk to God and ask him to come into your life. Maybe you need to pray something like this. Jesus, come into my life and be my Savior and my Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross to take away my sin. Take it away, Lord. Give me a clean new heart inside and help me to understand more about you and how to follow you all the days of my life. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would listen to your children praying and that you would respond and that we would be glad to feel and sense your response today and throughout this upcoming week as we go through the challenges of life. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.